Hello and welcome to your Year 13 UCAS Information Evening. Mr Bisley speaking here. Um, I get the opportunity to, to open this event really just by saying, first of all, just a massive sort of welcome back to all of our Year 13 students. Uh, it, it felt like you guys were only just starting to find your feet in Year 12 and starting to settle when this awful virus hit us. And unfortunately, your, your time in year 12 was cut short. So first of all, it's just it's so amazing to see you all back in the building. You really have been missed. And it's great to see you uh, back in learning, back in the classroom uh, and back on that right path to, to what you do next. Obviously, it has been a very difficult six months. And I have to say how impressed myself and my team have been in just how you guys have come back into the school and just got straight back into the swing of learning it's like you've almost been, a, it's like you've never been away, should I say. Uh, and that's a real real credit to yourselves and the way in which you, you're managing yourself. Uh, it has been a difficult time. Uh, six months have passed. There, there are lots of uncertainty about how the exams are going to look next summer. What I will promise you is, as it is communicated to myself, um, I will communicate that to you guys. So as I find out what the plans are, and as soon as we find out, how they intend to, to, to examine, to access the year 13 students, that will of course be shared with you. It is highly likely that this information will be made public knowledge. Um, I do not have a, a hotline to the Department for Education and, and there is no sort of heads up to head teachers before it is released publicly. So chances are we'll all be told at the same time, but anything we do find out, then obviously that will be shared with you guys. So, I mean, really from my perspective, this is an ideal opportunity for our year 13 students to, to take that responsibility for their futures and really push on this year. It is going to continue to be a strange year. The way in which we teach and the way in which we learn has been significantly impacted and affected by what is happening at the moment. But it is still an opportunity there for our students to, to take that responsibility and to grasp this with both hands and really, really push on there is a significantly increased emphasis on independent study this year both the time you get allocated in school for independent study and as importantly that time outside of school where you have the opportunity to continue your studies and, and, and further that knowledge in those subjects that is again very much on the responsibility of, of the students to really maximize that time you know, we, we will not get this time back again. So please, please make the most of that downtime that you have uh, to, to really try and pursue that independent study. It's such an important year, year 13. Time and time again, students are told that this year is the most important year. Year 11 is the most important year. And, and you know, when it comes to year 13s, it is the grades you get at the end of this year that will absolutely influence the next few years of your life, be that at university, be that an apprenticeship, or be that some sort of form of employment with training. Grades you get will determine where you go, what level you go in at, the pay you receive. So many things ride on these results that you get. So it's so important that if there was ever a year where you absolutely focused on your learning, your outcomes, and your future, this is definitely it. My team and myself, we are here to support you. We are here to challenge you, to push you. We will do everything we can to help you reach your potential. There will be many, many opportunities for you to extend that learning beyond just your timetabled lessons. And that is on you to grasp those opportunities. We will do everything we can to help guide you on your way. But like I've said, this is, this is your future really looking for our year 13 students to, to take that responsibility and to push on you know own your future own year 13 make this the best year for you and your outcomes and your results and um, please listen to, to everything that my colleagues have to say if you have got any questions i am going to be online afterwards so i will be able to to speak to people and, and hopefully help and um, enjoy the evening enjoy the presentation it's been, it's been wonderful talking to you and hopefully I will speak to you all soon. Thank you.
Hello and welcome. Thank you for all taking the time out to watch this presentation. I believe that we've met or at least spoke in some capacity last year. I'm Charlotte Kennedy and I'm the head of Sixth Form here at the UTC. As a reminder, myself and members of the senior leadership team will be online at 6pm to answer any questions that you have surrounding destinations or the presentation that you're about to watch. So you all are here because this is arguably the most important year in your child's education. With that in mind, by the end of this presentation, you should have better insight to previous destinations and UCAS process, apprenticeships and what to expect, academic mentoring and support, independent study, student welfare and bursary information. Of course, grades are important in any sixth form, but at the UTC we pride ourselves on the destinations that our students secure when they complete their journey through education. Here are just a few of the apprenticeship opportunities that Year 13 secured this year. I'm proud to say that most of these were with our employer sponsors. As you can see, I've included the grades achieved by those students. Despite a turbulent end to their education with us at the UTC, both students and staff have worked incredibly hard to gain acceptance onto some top university courses this year, and we look forward to hearing about their journeys in the future. As you can see, the majority of these courses are STEM related, and I have no doubt in my mind that the education they've received, in some cases over the last four years, would have set them up incredibly well to have a bright, successful future. So for us to get started, it's important for you to know who will be supporting Year 13 this year. The first port of contact for any student will be their mentor, and this will either be Mrs Hollywood or Mr Loosemore. Subject teachers have most likely completed the degree that students want to study. These will be a vital asset to any student looking to apply to university. Of course, I'm here as well to support any students within sixth form, and yourselves as parents can offer any support, guidance and experiences that you may have to. Ultimately though, students must research and make the right decision for them. As you can imagine, they're going to have numerous different insights and experiences that will be shared with them. You have to make sure that they're choosing the right decision. UCAS references. Over the summer, Year 12 teachers have written subject references for our current Year 13s. Mentor, mentors are currently writing these references and will collate all teacher comments to write a full reference for UCAS, job opportunities, apprenticeships, and anything further that students may require. Students are encouraged to discuss their predicted grades with their subject teachers. There should be no surprises when students will submit applications to universities on what subjects and what predicted grades have been put through for them. This can be a discussion, but ultimately the decision will lie with the teacher. This will generally happen around December for students to complete applications for January. After speaking with Year 13 last week, students should now have in place a UCAS application that they've begun, a completed draft personal statement. Obviously this will be draft and redrafted many different times. Uh, and completed an up-to-date full CV, a completed draft cover letter. So this will change dependent on what job that students are applying for, but they do need to have a starting point for mentors to be able to support them with this. Hopefully they would have looked at some shortlisted possible apprenticeship options or routes. A lot of the time year 13 come to me and just say, I want to do an apprenticeship. They have no idea what that apprenticeship is, what company, what level they're going to be applying for. They need to be starting to look at these as generally the apprenticeships will be coming out towards December to January time. And after the year that we've had, I'm going to assume that these will be, if not more so, competitive than they were last year. If students are looking to do an EPQ, so an extended project qualification, this proposal needs to have been completed and submitted to me. So students will have assemblies and mentoring. This happens every morning from 9 to 9.30. Uh, year 13 mentoring tasks this year will be focused on MOOCs and careers guidance. Um, mentors will collate references, so the more that they see these students, the more positive comments they will have to include. So 
very difficult to write a reference on a student when you don't have much information about what they're doing outside of school, what, um, what sports they may be taking part in, what jobs they may have, and what skills that they've acquired outside of the educational background. So of course myself and Miss Collins will have oversight of all applications. With that in mind, students that do apply to university, if they are hitting submit on the UCAS website, um, they need to be aware that those applications will actually come to myself before they get submitted. So if there are any changes that need to be made, I can then send that back to students before we submit together. All students will have a meeting with myself before we can actually send those applications off. So I'm just going to give you a little bit, a brief amount of information about the application process. Students obviously need to start choosing their courses. It's important for them to choose something that they enjoy and also will allow them to reach their goals. They need to be researching online what modules are included um, and think about what they enjoy day to day. So could this actually be a part of their future job role? Um, looking on different job sites and graduate career options. So after they come out of education with that degree, does it link to what their career options are and what they require for those? Um, looking for ideas on what they'd like to do once they've finished studies and work backwards would be a useful bit of advice. So to look at what needs to go into the personal statement then, Ultimately, admissions tutors are looking for four different sections within these statements. Students will be provided with support and guidance by mentors, but this is a good starting point for them, for yourselves if you're reading over applications and personal statements, just to see if they're on the right lines. Um, the application initially will have their personal details and chosen courses. They're then going to look at their qualifications and the grades obtained, so what they've got. They need to make sure that they're checking with their subject teachers that the qualifications they are putting in are correct. There are a lot of drop down options. They need to make sure that they're selecting the right exam board and the course titles that they're currently studying, especially for A levels. We'll then look at references as section four and the personal statement as section three. It goes without saying that the most important part of this application is their love of the subject and their experiences. This comes within the personal statement. So this will be 4,000 characters, including spaces, or 47 lines on UCAS, not on Word. So it's important for them to draft up their personal statements on a Word document and keep saving it in numerous different places. Also to email it to themselves just in case they lose it or to make sure they have it on hand. And also, when they then upload from words to UCAS, it may be that the lines are broken down or they've got too many characters, they just need to be aware of this. They can't change the fonts or anything like that, they can't add pictures or diagrams or anything, it will just be those characters that are submitted. It's written as an essay, not as a letter, they don't need to be um, addressing it to anyone or signing it off. It should have paragraphs, it should be well written. This is their first opportunity to impress the admission tutors and potentially course leaders. As a bit of advice, students need to be aware that the UCAS page will time out that internet page. So if they are working on their personal statement online, they need to make sure that they're doing it somewhere else and saving it because if it does time out, they will lose what they've already done. One of the most important bits of advice that I gave students is using this method. So looking at the activity that they have done or something that they've completed in school or in work experience or in a job. Showing what benefit this has, so what are the skills that they've gained. And then looking at the course, how does this relate to the course that they're applying for? The universities want to know how they are going to be standout students and what they're going to do on this course. Mentors will be looking for this when they're providing feedback and guidance on personal statements. So as a quick checklist then, students shouldn't be repeating information. It wastes space. They only have their 4,000 characters that they need to make sure that everything fits into. Don't offer these underdeveloped lists and I've told them to avoid these cliches of when I was young and those sorts of things. 
Um, avoid unintentional humour, what they may find funny, the um, admissions people may not find funny at all. Think about their spelling, grammar and vocabulary. As I said, this is important. This is their first view to impress. Add their own comments, so their explanations of what they've done, why they've done it. And use some experiences to reflect this, so to provide a little bit of evidence about what they've been doing. So some final advice for students then. They need to get organised. They need to worry about themselves in year 13. Ultimately, this is their last year of education before moving on to UCAS or well, to a university or to an apprenticeship or a job. They have to focus on themselves and the grades that they're going to get next year. Make use of the resources that are about us teachers as well. We are resources to them. We need to make sure that they're asking us if there is any more guidance that we could give any sort of direction that we can point them in. Draft in Microsoft Word, spell check, proofread before it goes on to UCAS. Keep a copy in case they're called to interview, so they might be asked to discuss different things. This is especially the case within um, architectural routes or design courses. Do not plagiarise, they will know, they will get found out. Just for a little bit of side information, you can refer back to this at your own time. So um, here is the buzzword if students haven't linked to that buzzword to so GPUTC 2020 as it looks there, then their um, applications will not be attached to our school. So we won't be able to see applications or help them submit them. The UCAS centre number is also there. So in terms of UCAS information then, the application fee is £26 for multiple course entries. This will be five courses that they can apply for, all five separate universities, and for any late applications sent after the 30th of June. I highlight that the Oxbridge and medical course application deadline is October 15th. So it's the student's responsibility to book in their own admissions test if they're looking to complete an Oxford application. They need to speak to their mentors about this as soon as possible. The standard application submission deadline is January 15th. We don't want to be waiting until January 15th to submit, but that deadline is there as the very last day. Students may look to go to open days. I know a lot of these in our current climate are being done virtually. Um, but if for any reason they do end up attending a university open day, then we encourage them to do this on the weekends where available. Um, students can complete one during the week, but post application, so once they've submitted their applications, these absences will not be authorised for students. They must provide email confirmation of these days sent to myself and Lynn Donaldson so that we can mark our registers accordingly. Just some important contact information then. So my email address is there and Miss Collins, who is the SAT link to stage five. As I said before, we have two year 13 mentors, so Mr. Loosemore and Miss Hollywood, and their information is there if you wish to contact them. Hello, I'm Steve Colby. I'm the Vice Principal here at the Greater Peterborough UTC and I'm just going to spend a few moments talking about uh, apprenticeships, what they mean, what they are and, uh, and so hopefully to give you a little bit more information about apprenticeships and the different types that your, your child may want to go into once they finish with us here at the Greater Peterborough UTC. So I think that that statement there really encapsulates quite well uh, what an apprenticeship is. Um, a way for young people and adult learners to earn while they learn in a real job, gaining a real qualification and a real future. Um, hard, to, hard to argue with any of that. Um, I think that apprenticeships are a really valuable sort of asset moving forward for some of our students, uh, something that we encourage here at the UTC. And of course, we try and keep ourselves as up to date as possible with the apprenticeships out there, which are our fantastic sponsors, of which some of which are around this presentation. I hope you can, you can know and identify a few of those. Give us all the sort of latest up to date um, data and details on what their apprenticeships are offering uh, and what they can do for our young people. So I think we're going to start off with talking about what an apprenticeship is exactly. And I think it's quite, quite important to talk about what it's not. Um, certainly there was a stigma, I think, attached to apprenticeships from many years back where there was a sort of a, a vision that a, 
a new apprentice would do their job and they would be holding a torch, perhaps watching somebody else work for a good few months before being allowed to do anything themselves, maybe making cups of tea for the older members of staff. But that certainly has changed now. And that's not what an apprenticeship is about anymore at all. It's completely been redesigned and restructured to something called an apprenticeship standard. And these standards come in a varying level of different qualification. Um, it is, of course, an opportunity for any age learner to earn and learn. So another interesting fact might be that you're 16 or 18, 19 year old, maybe sort of sat beside a 30 year old conducting these apprenticeship studies. Um, job trade and specific organisation skills are very bespoke to the organisation. So actually a real benefit of an apprenticeship is all of the skills that they will be learning are specific to that specific trade or that organisation's requirements, which are obviously really useful. All apprenticeships now are designed to have transferable skills and, and that, doesn't, that doesn't mean transferable into sort of uh, a, another job. What that's kind of talking about is transferable from one apprenticeship to another, from one organisation to another. So, for example, if somebody was studying an apprenticeship in the motor trade and then they decided they wanted to do something different, so maybe be at the aerospace trade, there would be some skills that they learn in that apprenticeship and some qualifications that can actually be moved across. So, for example, some of the academic units may be the same and some of the knowledge based or the practical based units may be similar. So they can be transferred across also. All of these apprenticeships are, of course, now nationally recognised qualifications uh, and the varying levels mean that they mean different things, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. And this, of course, includes options for learners of all abilities um, to actually enrol onto these apprenticeships with some fantastic organisations. Uh, some small facts here, I suppose, for you. I think apprenticeships are available now in over 1,500 job roles across 280 skills and industries. And there's just some lists there of who, who, what sort of sectors are taking on apprenticeships, such as engineering, veterinary, nursing, sciences, accounting, aerospace, all the way through to digital media. There are, of course, hundreds more. I think most organisations sectors now, especially with the introduction of the apprenticeship levy, are getting really involved in trying to bring on the skill sector uh, of this country and our young people and investing in them in their future to bolster their organisation's workforce. Uh, in 2017 to 18, there were about 30, 375,000 apprenticeships. And from the, the year up from that, that went up almost 100,000 to 450,000. Uh, rather unsurprisingly, the statistics for 1920 haven't quite been released. I think that the, um, the current state of affairs really with COVID-19 may have seriously disrupted that figure. Um, so unfortunately, we've got there as 80, 90, but you can see that apprenticeships were heavily, heavily on the rise. And I suspect that they will continue to be moving forward. So let's go talk about apprenticeship standards and progression. Um, this is a uh, sort of overview of what an apprenticeship is from the start all the way through to the end. Um, and it's important to know that different skill sectors and different organisations may do this ever so slightly differently. Uh, but the actual flow of what an apprenticeship looks like very much sort of follows these, uh, these five points coming up now. It will start, of course, with an interview. Now, here at the UTC, we are really proud to have all of our sponsors come in frequently. We run multiple sessions on interview styles, interview techniques, CV writing, application writing, and all this sort of thing, just to try and give our students the head start. And of course, we've got the people who are running these very apprenticeship skills and centre days there to sort of coach and mentor them through that, which is a fantastic opportunity. Um, but at the interview stage, the students might see a number of different things. There might be an initial skills test or a baseline testing. Um, so even though usually to even get through the door to be considered for these, you may have to have a number of GCSEs or even A-levels, depending on what level you're going in for. But still, they may choose to baseline test. One of the biggest reasons for doing that is to start to categorise and factor in the strongest candidates um, from day one. Pretty much talent spotting uh, from the first day that they're meeting these young people. There may well be then a panel interview, highly likely to be a panel interview. Um, again, something that we try and prepare our students for from day one. There'll be maybe a team working exercise and a leadership exercise. And again, the reason for this really is starting to talent spot early doors. There's also a way that you can progress if you, for example, have applied for a level three apprenticeship and you show really, really strong teamwork and leadership exercise. They may well start to cherry pick people and move them up higher onto different levels of uh, apprenticeship to sort of pick their future leaders and managers. Onto that, usually an apprenticeship then goes straight to the knowledge phase and that feels very much like you are back at school. There'll be an academic phase to that, uh, to the apprenticeship and that may involve some maths units, some physics units, depending on what apprenticeship it is, of course, but it will very much be back to an academic phase. These units have to be passed um, at a pass rate that's obviously determined by the organisation and the skill sector that they're going for. Uh, but they will have to be passed before they can be progressed. 
there'll be some sort of skills phase. So that will be the manual dexterity side. And again, that's dependent on the trade and the organization that they're going into. Um, but that may be so well you consolidating some of that theory of learnt, putting it into a practical exercise, always elements of health and safety in there, making sure that our young people can comply to the Health and Safety at Work Act and all of those kinds of things. Behaviour is constantly assessed throughout an apprenticeship. Now, we're not talking about naughty or nice here. Obviously, good, excellent behaviour is expected across all organisations. What they're looking at there is the behaviours of whichever organisation or skills they're looking at going into. That may be honesty, teamwork, cooperation, integrity, so on and so forth. Um, behaviours is notoriously hard for apprenticeship providers to actually assess. However, it is something that's deemed really important when it comes to looking at whether an organisation wants to invest in these young people in the future. Uh, finally, the, uh, once you've probably progressed most of the way through the apprenticeship, there's now something called an endpoint assessment or, or an EPA. Uh, and what that is, is an in independent professional organisation comes in and looks through your portfolio. That would be a portfolio looking to make sure that the knowledge level and sector was, was uh, achieved to the highest level that it needed to be, that the skills were assessed fairly and that behaviours were monitored throughout the course. Uh, uh, the endpoint assessment will include an interview with the candidate to look at consolidating all that. Um, once they've got through that, fingers crossed, then they finally got their apprenticeship completed. So I mentioned earlier at the start, there are different levels of apprenticeship available uh, and they vary from a level two all the way up to a level seven as this slide shows. Uh, intermediate apprenticeships come in at level two. They're usually about 12 to 18 months in length and they're equivalent themselves to about five GCSEs, grades four through nine. Uh, a prance advanced apprenticeship, sorry, uh, that's coming in at level three. They can, they're usually a bit longer, sometimes up to two years. Again, it completely depends on the course, but their weighting is equivalent to about two A-levels. And then levels fours through to seven, you're looking at two years plus, and these are the, uh, these are the amazing higher degree apprenticeships that can, um, that can lead to a foundation degree or higher level, depending on what that is. Now, you may remember slightly earlier on, I mentioned that some people start to sort of cherry pick their talent. Uh, it's, it's highly likely that some of our more able students, perhaps going for a level three qualification apprenticeship, absolutely shine and blossom at their interview stage and their baseline testing. Uh, and the organisation says, Do you know what, I think this person's got a little bit more about them. I'm going to have a, you know, take a risk on them and put them through for the higher or degree apprenticeship. So there's really important opportunities and milestones that our young people can reach through an apprenticeship. And it's something that we sort of, again, we really try and get these young people ready for that and those opportunities that may present themselves to it. And again, down the bottom, just reiterating that knowledge, competence, qualification, employability skills are, are across the board. They're going to be looked at through the entire duration of the apprenticeship. Um, higher apprenticeships, so those degree apprenticeships, these are the ones that are really fought after. Now, these are um, fantastic opportunities. These are in, in employment, being paid, studying for a degree level uh, qualification at the same time because of the amazing opportunity these give, they are extremely competitive. Um, so we're looking at our young people going into apprenticeships to make sure they're absolutely armed with all of the information they need to know perhaps about the organisation, but specifically the sector they're going into. We'll work very hard with our students to make sure that any sort of teamwork assessments or anything like that, they're absolutely prepared for. So that when they go to these assessment days and these assessment centres, they have every opportunity to try and get there um, and be successful. Where to look? Uh, you can, of course, come here. We have Katie Elias, who is our, who is our own sort of career guidance. Um, she's getting a level six qualification herself this year. Um, so she'll be a really powerful person to have. But of course, we've also got the links to our current sponsors and employers, which means that we've got a, a route in to find out what exactly is going on in the sector. And it is a sector that changes so frequently. It's so difficult to keep up with. Um, so always come here to us. But we also pay into a company called Unifrog. All of our students have got a login for Unifrog so they can go in there, they can type in their interests, their sort of predicted grades and things like that. And it will just start to generate some ideas of what apprenticeship and what levels these students should be going into. Uh, the government website, uh, the apprenticeship website, uh, that's, got a, that's got a plethora of detail on there. Actually, it is quite good. A lot of suppliers, especially the bigger organisations, put quite a lot of effort into making sure that the government apprenticeship site is updated. So that's got a load of good information on there. There's a website called Apprenticeship Finder and Rate My Apprenticeship that are all completely uh, sort of neutral and they just talk about all the different apprenticeships. There's loads of good quotes on there from some current students and uh, people who've either done the apprenticeship or are still doing the apprenticeship uh, and they will talk to you all about all the different things that you might find from their apprenticeship. So I hope that's been useful for you. If there are any questions, please feel free to come back to us uh, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Bye bye.
Hello, I'm Laura Collins, Director of Progress at GPUTC, and I'm going to be talking to you about academic support, assessment and examinations. I'd like to start by saying it's great to see Year 13 back in school and studying full time in the classroom. As currently, the next academic year is a little less certain than usual. I wanted to take this time to clarify what we do know and how we will be supporting our learners in the coming months to achieve the very best outcomes that they can. When the country went into lockdown back in March, we all had to adapt really quickly to a new way of working. Turnout for online learning during lockdown for year 13s was impressive with attendance far exceeding many sixth forms in the area. This put most of our learners in a strong position going forward, but that's not to say we don't, do not recognize that there'll be significant gaps in knowledge which will need to be quickly identified and filled in the covered weeks and months. From the 15th of September, we have invited all year 13 students back to face-to-face -face study full-time. The structure of their timetables have changed. We have moved to the blocked timetable for the foreseeable future. This has two benefits. It reduces the transit time between lessons and therefore reduces the risk of contact between year groups. It also enables us to maximize the time that learners spend in lessons when they are on site. Students who study the equivalent of three A-levels are typically in school for three and a half days. The expectation is that the remainder of the time they are working independently at home. As last year, all students have been timetabled with two hours of independent study in school where they are expected to complete any outstanding work set during class time, consolidate learning and practice past exam questions. This year, to help bridge some of those gaps, we're introducing a Year 13 academic mentoring program. Selected students who would benefit from this program will be allocated a mentor who will provide individualized or small group support. This could be in the form of a vision or catch up sessions, accessing external support, support with revision planning, timetables, or helping the learner to prioritize and manage workloads. All year 13 students will undertake mock examinations during the second and third week of November. It's really important that students are fully prepared for these assessments so that staff and students can use these results as a benchmark of where to focus their efforts moving forward. This year, centre assessed grades were used to grade A-levels and vocational qualifications. At this point, this is not what we expect to happen this year, but in case it's vital that the school has evidence of the students' true abilities through mock examinations and classroom assessment, in case the school is asked for teacher assessed grades in the future. The results of the mock examinations will help tailor our intervention plans and any bespoke sessions that will be put in place after half term. Some dates for your diary. First of all, we are introducing an attitude to learning report. This will inform students and parents about how learners have settled back into classrooms and what their attitude has been like to returning to school. Your first one of these will be sent home at the end of October. As I've said, the mock exams are running in the second and third week of November. There will also be an additional mock exam period at the end of February. This year, Year 13s will be receiving two academic reports, which will provide indicative grades of likely outcomes. Your first report will be sent home on the 11th of December and the follow-up one on the 19th of March. The date for the year 13 parent consultation is the 7th of January. We will update you nearer the time as to whether this will take place face to face or virtually. And finally from me, external exam arrangements. 
The dates of the summer examinations are still provisional, which is unusual for this time of year. There is a national consultation taking place at the moment that is looking to see when the best dates for these exams will be. There is a chance that they may be pushed back by three weeks, but by, this is no means confirmed. Also, exam boards are reviewing curriculum content, which will be assessed this year. We don't anticipate any changes to be made, but we are waiting to the DfE Ofqual announcement, which will be made in October, which will confirm both curriculum content and the dates of the external examinations. We've also got this exam contingency day. This is a day every year that it's put aside in case anything goes wrong during the exams. It's the day that all students must be available should they need to come in and set, sit an exam. So that date stays the same. It is the 29th of June. This is the day that all students need to be around for just in case something happens. As soon as these announcements are made, we will be back in touch and communicate with you exactly what the plan is. That's it from me. I'll be available Thursday evening should you have any questions or need clarification on anything. Good evening, everybody. My name is Lynn Donaldson and I'm the Director of Support at Greater Peterborough UTC. Uh, myself and Emma Coleman are the student support team here. Um, I'm just here tonight to talk you through a couple of things. And uh, the first thing is to talk you through some of what have been our biggest challenges in recent months. So I'm just going to talk to you of some strategies on how to cope with change and how to cope with stresses and strains in life and, and how we how we get through that. Some of us as adults obviously will benefit from some of these tips as well. Um, but I really I want to share this with you now so that you can support your young people to uh, having a really successful year. So I'm just going to start with change. Um, we have faced so many changes as a nation, as a world in the last few months, that it's really important that we kind of proactively look at how we cope with that change. Um, so some suggestions here, we, we, if you think about how our lives have changed in the last few months, we look at how our lives have changed in terms of communication, in terms of the, the way we operate in society, the freedoms, the things we have to do now, the way we operate in school, the way we have been educating our young people. Um, it's been so different. I think something we just need to ground ourselves with a few tips. So this is some things I would suggest for you and your young people to cope with change. Firstly, focus on what you can control. So there's so much that when, you, when you're coping with change, the change can feel overwhelming. It can feel like it is completely controlling your entire life. But actually, the way to do that is to control the percentages. So think about planning your week. Uh, think about how you can sort of set up boundaries in your week for yourself. So that's taking care of the basics. It's considering how many hours of sleep do I need? And young people need more sleep um, than, than in order to, for their brains to continue to grow and develop. So they do need sleep. And it's really important that that is there because that does help to cope. Um, it helps you to cope and rationalise everything else that's going on in your life. Controlling your food and drink in, intake, thinking about what it is that is going to um, be nutritious for you, be healthy for you, is really important. You can control that and you can control whether your intake is good for you or whether that's starting to spiral out of control. Exercise is another way that we can take control of the basics. The, the, the way we care for ourselves and our bodies has a real impact on mental health. Mental and physical health go hand in hand. So those things are really, really important. And if you've taken care of the basics, the percentage of your week that is now involved in things that are changing is much smaller than it felt like at the beginning. And then if you build in your opportunities for your normal fun activities, and just even if it's once a week when you sit and watch a film, when you sit and watch a terrible program on television and laugh at it with your family or your friends, you're starting to build in opportunities for normal activity. And then the change is a smaller percentage again and it means that you can start to really focus on the fact that the majority of your life isn't changing. There's just a few things that are. So that's my first tip, is control what you can control. Secondly, what you're left with after you've done that control 
is probably like to be quite trauma it's quite probably like to be quite negative and it might be quite traumatic there's a lot going on there so it's about reframing negative thoughts where you can and obviously where change is very very difficult very dramatic this might not always be possible but sometimes you can always you can you can usually find a way of making a negative thought a positive thought because it's how you think about a situation that is um that, that is that influences how you feel so if you believe that a changing routine is hard then if you continue to believe that this changing routine is hard then it's almost like a self-fulfilling self-fulfilling prophecy you come back to that idea you believe it's hard because you've told yourself it's hard but if you can start to say yes being back at school is hard that changing routine is difficult but actually that means i get to see my friends in person more frequently that's a good thing you find a way of making it positive you reframe that thought the lockdown has been difficult on all of us and um, not seeing extended family as much is really hard um, but a way to reframe that might be to consider the positives it's, it's taught you it might be that you've you know talk around how you zoom and now actually we talk to them more often it's certainly the case you know you, you, because of the technology we're talking to people more often even if it's at a distance so that's a couple of things to help us cope with change um, and stress is something i always talk about with year 11 presentations because stress and exams is, is so common um, and we do put so much pressure on ourselves to do well in those sorts of um, situations so some tips for coping with stress Exercise relieves the buildup of fight or flight hormone. So fight or flight hormones absolutely flood the body. And one way to reduce that flood of hormones is to exercise it away, so to just move, move the body so that it is dissipating. Fresh air and sunlight also reduce that tension and exercise outdoors is really good for you and it has a huge impact on your mental health. As I said earlier, mental health and physical health go hand in hand. Something that's worth bearing in mind for the adults as much as the students, and I am guilty of this in the darkest days of November, um, more caffeine doesn't equal more energy at all. It means we're more wired and it means we're more jumpy. So consider intake, uh, food and drink intake and how it will have an impact on you. We know that biscuits and caffeine are actually not going to make us any feel better. Feel any better. They're going to make us feel more stressed um, because you know, the, the sugar highs, the sugar lows and the caffeine is just not going to be good for us. And we know that. So when we're not very stressed, we can plan to not use those as support when, because we know actually that it's not, it doesn't help in the long run. And um, this is something I believe strongly in. Sleep fixes almost everything. If your sleep patterns are dist disturbed, then you um, everything becomes more stressful. Your body can't cope. So stress does uh, it's just stress is more common in people who are not sleeping well. So do everything you can to get enough. Those three are really important. Um, and then there are loads of relaxing activities that work for some people. And if this is a case of trial and error, they really don't necessarily work for everybody. Uh, meditation or mindfulness can be really, really helpful for some people. And for other people, it just doesn't work. It stresses them out more because they can't do it. But it's worth trying. Um, yoga, Pilates, anything relaxing forms of exercise can be really good. They focus on your breathing and they focus on you and just focusing on the energy in your body and not focusing on what's going on around you. Breathing exercises, listening to music, anything that you can to Google relaxing activities and try some and see if they work for you. But the best thing to do is to try them when you're only a little bit stressed. Don't wait until you are extremely stressed to try these because you need to build up the habit uh, and the kind of like the regular practice of some of these things so that you know you can go to it as a strategy for coping with stress. So I hope those tips have been helpful because actually that's what you can do before you come to us. And if you've tried all of that and you still need more support, and that's absolutely okay if you do because you are young people, uh, you are not, you know, you don't have all the strategies yet, you don't have all the answers. If you do need um, some more support, then talking to people, anyone, about anything actually can have a really good impact on your stress take your mind off things it can focus you on something else completely different or if you are able to talk to somebody and break down what's stressing you out work out the root of the problem talk to somebody who can help you with a solution take control of your stress don't let it control you find a way of breaking it down now we can support with that so in the student support office on the ground floor we're opposite computer science and art we offer that drop-in support 
if you do want to break down that stress, if you want to work out what it is that's really stressing you out, and it's, if you're not struggling, if you're, you've tried these strategies and it's not enough, then you come down and you, you pop in to see us. We, hope, we also help with pastoral support with attendance, with coping strategies for lessons and coping with issues amongst friends. We offer um, an appointment service for the crops mentoring service. We've got very sm sort of small amounts of um, slots for people to take part in that mentoring service, which is not counselling, but it is uh, somebody to talk to once a week, plan your strategies and think about how you're going to cope in the future with stresses. Um, exam stresses is a very common one for the mentoring service. We were also able to arrange appointments with the school nurse and the ICASH sexual health um, nurses as well. If we feel, once we've spoken to you, that you need some external support, we have a range of options available once we've gone through all of those strategies with you. We can help you to get a referral to COOP, which is an online mental health and wellbeing support service. We have um, Centre 33 in Peterborough, which is a local counselling service for 16 to 24 year olds. Um, we can also put you in touch with local youth and mental health services. Um, so this, the, there are different tiers of support, basically. Um, you do need to, you know, there's loads you can do yourself before you come and talk to us. And if you do want to talk to us, you're welcome to pop down at any time. Um, and then if you do need that further support, we can put you in contact with those people. If you need a reminder of how, of what that support is and how and how to get in contact with us or anybody else, you will now find in, in very shortly, you will find um, student welfare boards in the year group social spaces. That contains loads of information about internal and external support and a load, of, a load of information for you to look at there. Throughout the year, we do assemblies and we um, drop in bits and pieces into mentoring matters as well. So you will understand the support that's available to you. And obviously, if you have any questions, you are welcome to pop and see us on the ground floor. You are absolutely welcome to pop in and see us and, and ask us any questions. Um, so, so that's the student support uh, team. I will be online this evening as well. So if parents or students have any questions, you are absolutely welcome to ask me those questions then. It's been lovely to talk to you. I hope that's been helpful. Uh, I look forward to seeing you soon.